Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. I am Mark Graben from Kinexus, and on behalf of the Kinexus team, we are very happy to be hosting uh, today's webinar, which is going to be presented by Paul Wainwright. As you can see from his email address, and as you will tell soon from his voice, he is joining us today from uh, the UK, and he's going to be presenting what is sure to be a, an interesting and thought-provoking webinar titled Learning to Embrace Positive Deviance. And so before I introduce Paul, let me just talk about the logistics for everybody who's here on the webinar. If you can please advance the slide. So the presentation you know, will be probably about 45 minutes long. We will leave time at the end for questions and answers. So any point along the way, we always encourage single piece flow of questions. If something occurs to you at any point, Use the GoToWebinar control panel, enter a question, and I will um, ask those to Paul at the um, end of the webinar. So again, please feel free to enter those questions at any time. We will send out a email with a link to a recording and uh, the slides, a PDF of those slides that are available on SlideShare. Uh, sometimes people like to go ahead and download the slides um, for note-taking purposes, and you can find those either under the handouts section of the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, there is a Adobe Acrobat logo and um, the presentation name, or if you look under the chat section, there is a link to that page on SlideShare. So let me now introduce our presenter, Paul Wainwright. So Paul is the Managing Director of Initiate Business Excellence, a consultancy business specializing in enabling organizations to achieve positive and progressive change. The eight core elements <clears throat> supporting the Initiate Business Excellence framework are focused on strategy, design, leadership, process, change, customer, learning, and empowerment. So having worked with a, wide, with a range of organizations in various sectors, Paul has experience of leading business improvement projects, introducing continuous improvement frameworks, and working with senior leaders to train and develop their leadership and management skills. So Paul is a Lean Six Sigma black belt, so he's very familiar with the challenges that organizations face on the ground. And uh, he actively works with leaders of organizations to go to the Gemba and to overcome these challenges. So Paul also works closely with a local university, delivering material on their MBA course while also offering free consultancy to local charities to help them formulate and deploy operational strategies, enabling them to reach their goals and objectives. And Paul, as you see here on the slide, and I'll let him explain what is meant by this particular phrase, um, is a positive deviant um, at Kinexus. We like positive deviants. A lot of our customers are positive deviants, and you may be one even if you're not familiar with this term. So um, with that, Paul, uh, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, great. Thanks for that introduction, Mark. Um, it's, um, it's great to be here today and great to be working with the guys at Kinexus again. I'd just like to thank everyone who's found time to either download this webinar or listen today. Um, I hope it triggers some interesting debate uh, and considerations. Hopefully, it maybe even helps you in your day-to-day -day trials and tribulations as change agents in your respective organizations. I've had and continue to have uh, the privilege of being able to work with a range of organizations of varying sizes in different sectors and in different industries. Um, and this has given me a unique insight into what makes some organizations better at certain things than, than others. And I've got to say that often leadership is a significant contributor to success or failure. It's great to see organizations embrace change uh, and listen uh, and learn to listen and reflect. On the other hand, it's such a shame to see organizations fail their employees by not listening and and not recognizing that things need to be done differently, things may need to change. Um, at the end of the webinar, I'm gonna share my contact details. Um, so please feel free to contact me afterwards if you'd like to discuss anything I've covered today. It would be great to get your insights into this subject and your experiences, because um, it is really a, a fascinating subject, so I'm, I'm very keen to hear your thoughts. Okay, so on that note, let's get started. Uh, to help today, I've included a few high-level objectives for this webinar. 
Firstly, I'd like to reflect on what's meant by traditional change, what this actually means, uh, the techniques typically used, the motivations that result in change, the idealisms of change within that frame of reference. Secondly, I'd like to pull into this the concept of positive deviancy, what this means and why we all really need positive deviance in our organisations. And lastly, I'd like to discuss the cultural elements that must be considered when thinking of how organisations can embrace this wave of creativity and those challenges which inevitably come with it. OK, so change. Um, it's really everywhere, all the time. And it's present today more than ever before, really, in everything from our personal life to our career, to our national identity, things are in a, a constant state of flux. Whether this is deciding on a personal level to eat more healthily, or your organisation deciding to restructure, we're becoming generations of people who must not only accept change, but learn to expect it, use it and potentially exploit it. However, when considering change at an organisational level, in my experience, it's usually triggered from a higher directive. An instruction is generally issued from the higher levels of the organisation to do something differently. For example, I'm sure many people on this webinar, like myself, have sat in boardrooms where very senior members of, of the business announced something along the lines of, our margins are being eroded, we, we really need to improve Oh, we must become more efficient. And my personal favourite, we're going to become lean, guys. When this message lands, the responding silence speaks volumes, as does the sound of uh, everybody's eyes rolling. In many instances of change, a negative is sought out to help justify the change. Somehow creating a bogeyman seemingly helps to alleviate the pressure on the organization's leaders and reinforces the need to do things differently. Reflecting on the work of Cotter, the very same message is given. Establish urgency. It's the very first thing he highlights to help combat complacency. And as the list above on the screen shows, the urgency is created through negatives burning platforms and icebergs melting. But with an holistic message delivered from the peak of the organisation, a number of real issues do appear. Firstly, the managers are often tasked with an execution that they don't fully understand or believe in. They misinterpret the message. They may not have the skills required for the execution. They may have a lack of understanding around the real issues. They may not even believe in the solution. And as you move through the organisation, the urgency may slowly diminish throughout its ranks until it reaches the guys, the value adders, who become disillusioned by yet another change programme. Because let's face it, they might not understand the lingo, EBIT, EBITDA, book to bill, cash flow, working capital, revenue. Do they actually understand what they're being told? And they may resent this message because they understand the problem at the ground level. They've understood it all along. And now a solution is being proposed by somebody who they've never met, never spoken to, somebody who maybe doesn't understand the problem. So go figure. And let's be honest, the leaders may not always practice what they preach. However, starting out this way, in my experience, has a very clear reaction. People generally don't respond very well. This is from their own experiences, trials and tribulations over years of service that results in a scepticism that underlines the feelings and emotions felt by them at the point of the change intervention. So they're back to banging their heads against the same wall they were a few years earlier. And the quotes on the screen are pretty indicative of the kind of message I've heard as a change agent in organisations. My manager doesn't believe in it, so why should I? 
I've been telling them this for years, Paul, but they don't listen. So how are the managers going to change? The managers have got no idea how it actually works. It's a flash in the pan. I'll just ride it out. So each and every reaction on the screen traces back to the leaders, their response, their directive, and their influence. So when it fails, it's their failing. The people at the center of the change don't feel empowered. They don't feel accountable. They don't feel the same level of urgency. Now let's face it, why should they feel any different? They've seen this before, they'll see it again, and they already know the outcome, or so they believe. So how do managers protect themselves from this and this potential failing? Well, in reality, many managers build walls around their employees, their teams and, and their departments. They protect their silos from outside influence and invasion by building structures and systems to protect them, and their ideology. And again, let's face it, why not? They've often had years of experience and are comfortable with how things are done. Any challenge to this is a threat to their position and a threat to their status. So an organization may be faced with a situation where managers are building walls, walls around them to protect their own ideologies and their teams and their employees. And at the same time, their employees are totally disillusioned with the whole concept of the change and the idea that things could be done any better. And then we begin to wonder why the results aren't coming. People are complex and their reactions are even more complex. According to Edgar Schein, change triggers two forms of anxiety, survival anxiety and learning anxiety. As the name suggests, survival anxiety triggers feelings related to the fear of survival. The business may not survive. I may be without a job. I may get fired. Learning anxiety, on the other hand, triggers feelings related to the fear of your own inabilities or threats to your status. I can't learn how to do this. I'm not capable. I will lose power or I will lose my status. How we react is unique to us, but Shine highlights three common reactions. Firstly, denial. Denial that we don't need this. We don't need to change. I don't need to change. I don't need to do things differently. Secondly is blame. Well, we're only changing because Dave and accounts dropped the ball last quarter. And then the last one is the pursuit of extra compensation. Okay, okay, I'll do this, but I want more money if you want this doing right. The reaction of most managers is to amplify the survival anxiety. So this is artificially high in relation to learning anxiety. How often have you heard managers say something along the lines of, look, if we don't achieve this target, our future's not looking good, guys. However, what you now have is someone who is still worried that they can't do it, but now they're seriously concerned about the health of the organization and their own security. And in reality, that high level of anxiety is artificial. So you may get people running for the life rafts when the ship is perfectly fine. Shine suggests that you don't amplify the survival anxiety, but instead lower the learning anxiety with the intent of keeping the survival anxiety higher, but still relatively higher than learning anxiety. Therefore, the focus remains on survival, albeit to a lesser extent. But the concerns around personal abilities or inabilities and personal security are much lower than when they were to start. But how would a manager help reduce this learning anxiety? Well, Edgar Schein suggests that a positive vision is used to make the goal and objective clear. <clears throat> the leader reinforces the message with formal training. The leader is involved at each stage of the change program. Leaders acknowledge that learning 
is also done informally, away from the classroom. People are allowed to speak openly. Leaders reinforce the message by leading by example. And the structure and systems of the organisation are aligned to support the change. Now, in the UK, baseball isn't one of our pastimes. However, for the uh, for the baseball fans on the webinar, I was keen to, uh, to drop this example in. Babe Ruth said, never let the fear of striking out get in, in your way. <clears throat> now, this probably has different connotations depending on how you read it. But in my mind, I'm thinking as a manager, this message is quite clear. We need to attempt to put the team in a place where they aren't afraid to swing the bat, a place where failure is learning and challenge is encouraged. But wait, this is all good stuff and, and really interesting, but why should we wait for the iceberg to start melting or for the platform to burst into flame? Why can't change be an integral part of how a business functions? Why can't change be triggered by good things? Why should anxiety be a problem? How can we avoid or at least limit the anxiety around change? Processes will inevitably need to change over time. But more fundamentally than that, thoughts and feelings will need to change. If people aren't thinking about things differently and seeing the problems they have through a different frame of reference, that same problem will inevitably come back. The change will be on borrowed time. A good friend of mine speaks of the blancmange effect, where you apply pressure, but when you release, it simply springs back to its natural equilibrium. When people speak up and challenge the control mechanisms and authorities' viewpoints in a positive way, we know awesome things do happen. But why don't we see this more in the workplace? Imagine a workplace that sits in a unique position of balance between chaos and obedience, a real sweet spot, allowing a measured degree of freedom within a framework that not only allows challenge, but encourages it. As the slide says, why can't we become more deviant? And this is the point at which positive deviance really enters the frame. But first, let's put this concept into some kind of perspective. The quote on the screen for me is, is a great definition. Positive deviance refers to behavior that deviates from the norms of the reference group and has a positive effect on the organization. So basically, if the act results in damage or harm, then I'm afraid it's plain old deviance. It's no longer positive deviance. Positive deviance must have a positive outcome. But what is deviance? And it's a really big question that we can't cover over the course of an hour in this webinar, but a significant consideration that we must at least acknowledge. Sociological theory on deviance has many themes, some of which are functionalism, for example, which suggests that deviance is a necessary element and ultimately points to failings. Structuralism suggests that deviance is a result of conformity to a group. So if you don't do this or you don't do that, then you're a deviant. Interactionalism suggests that deviance is a negotiated perspective. Whilst Marxism suggests that the norms and values are built in to support the, the rulers. But fundamentally, a positive deviant may simply reject the system in favour of a new and preferred set of values, norms and behaviours. Rejection of values, norms and behaviours may be the rejection of them at an organisational level. For example, the rejection of a corporate culture. Or it may very well be the rejection of an employee subculture, as this may differ from the corporate culture. Either way, in both scenarios, there is a potential of being seen as a deviant, a troublemaker, someone who is rocking the boat, or worse, a traitor. So let's think real world examples. <clears throat> well, on my way to work each morning, I drive out of my village onto a stretch of road that has a 30 mile per hour speed limit. 
It's usually quite early, so I set the cruise control to 30 and just drive through. However, I often have people rushing to get to work, overtaking me, clearly breaking the speed limit. In fact, the norm is for people to drive at speeds over the speed limit. Therefore, you have a rule in that the mainstream fail to follow. Deviants break the rule. However, by following the rules and breaking the social norms of the mainstream, in this instance, I'm the deviant as well. The guy riding the bicycle or their segue to work is a deviant because they're not following convention. Popular culture is littered with examples of deviant behaviour from, from Bowie to The Clash. Artists who decided that the mainstream lacked the depth of quality and the voice that was needed to represent the wider audience. When considering continuous improvement, it gets really interesting. Should we consider Toyota as positive deviants? They opposed convention at the time in favour of a production system radically different from the norms that were common practice. Deviance is a complex subject and is clearly relative to a number of factors. The positive deviant may find a degree of comfort in challenging any levels of the culture of an organisation. Considering Edgar Schein's model of culture, each layer is up for grabs with a positive deviant. Whether it's the artefacts, the things that we see around us each day, or the core fabric of underlying assumptions that decisions are based on, perspectives taken when developing strategies, or even the preconceived notions around how we speak and how we dress. The positive deviant will knock over barriers in pursuit of improvement. Francesco Gino writes in her fantastic book, Rebel Talent, of characteristics or traits that a positive deviant will display. And if anybody listening is, is looking for a book to read around Rebels, positive deviance, this sort of field. I'd certainly recommend recommend this book by Francesca. It's a fantastic piece of work. Um, so she suggests uh, that the characteristics or traits of a positive deviant, firstly, well, they embrace the rebel inside. They don't shy away from acknowledging that they have a desire to do things differently. The example she uses in her book is a well-known Italian chef who takes very classical and traditional dishes and puts a unique and new spin on them. And when he started doing this, he encountered a great deal of resistance, but he kept his conviction, and now this guy is world-renowned with multiple Michelin stars to his name. Uh, the positive deviants seek out opportunities to take themselves out of their comfort zones, as they know that being uncomfortable is a good thing for their personal growth. They seek out answers constantly. Like inquisitive children, positive deviants will question everything, to increase their understanding and, and knowledge. However, they understand that they can't know everything, so they take steps to learn from, from those that do and think outside of their own viewpoint. Diversity is a key contributor to success, and positive deviants understand that an individual, individual's gender, colour, nationality, or otherwise is, is irrelevant. What is relevant is what that person can bring to the team. Positive deviants place focus on their own strengths, take steps to build on these. There isn't a preference to dwell on weaknesses. And lastly, they take time to create engagement through storytelling and understanding their contribution with regards to the bigger picture. <clears throat> Pascal and Sterling formulated a series of characteristics similar to Gino in, in their work. They suggested that positive deviants Look for the invisible innovators. Look for those things that others can't see, the opportunities and people that can help progress the organisation. They seek the outliers and exceptions <clears throat> in the pursuit of challenge. They learn through doing, which means that they make mistakes. Yeah, of course they do. But they learn and keep going. They allow people to opt out if they don't want in. And they allow people to discover their own solutions to their own problems and then let those people own it. So if that is what a positive deviant looks like, what does a leader look like who supports this? And what does an organisation look like that encourages this? 
as was highlighted at the start of the webinar, in most instances, change programs can be commenced through a top-down initiative that is resulting from a failing or a negative. When retaining a current mindset or framework shackled by predetermined cultural elements, the change is often constrained and reliant on extrinsic rewards such as cash, promotions or benefits. This transactional leadership style is, in my view, unsustainable as needs and wants shift through one's working life. Pay rise today is great, but tomorrow it's forgotten. For me, the danger is that everyone is pulling together, providing that the rewards keep coming. Transactional leadership may simply ensure compliance and engagement to a movement. Any challenge can be discouraged in favour of adherence. Transformational leadership, on the other hand, makes the case for developing a motivation for change through intrinsic means. For example, people want to do this because they feel it's right. Initial synergies to positive deviance is pretty clear. However, one must consider that this style of leadership may be directed through vision and strategy. And these things may not be correct or appropriate. And whilst the commitment to the organisation is admirable, is it in the best interest of the organisation? Engagement to a misguided vision can be destructive and it can be damaging. The real danger of this style of leadership, in my view, is that everyone is working towards a goal or objective that's simply wrong, purely because they've been persuaded by some charismatic leadership figure. So on this basis, both of these two styles offer reasoning to suggest it's preferred and also not. Leadership based on extrinsic reward may be unsustainable and promote a culture of self-preservation. Leadership based on intrinsic reward may be self-limiting to the vision of the leader. Interestingly, in the study on the screen, it's highlighted the needs to combine transactional leadership with empowerment, encouraging involvement in decision making, working design, and wider active, active participation. The key here for me is, is empowerment. Participants must feel empowered, not simply engaged. For the authors of a study, psychological empowerment is a motivational concept, a series of psychological states that are necessary for individuals to feel in control over their work. They must first perceive work as meaningful and then believe in their own competence to actually do the task and then have a sense of self-determination and control over the work outcomes, have that responsibility and that accountability. They suggest that because of that sense of meaning and self-determination, empowered people will want to do their jobs as well as possible and will deviate from the rules or the norms if it will allow them to execute their work in the best possible way. Indeed, similar findings have been concluded by others. The research team referenced in the slide found that a psychological empowerment element was an integral part of their constructive deviance model, which highlights a series of characteristics they suggest result in constructive deviance. Three characteristics on the screen being intrinsic motivation. So this link back to uh, transformational leadership the feeling of obligation and psychological empowerment. So the need to feel empowered is clearly a theme in current research conducted by the guys I've included in the presentation. Indeed, in my own research that I carried out on an organisation undergoing continuous improvement activities, I found that an interesting dynamic was presented between employees simply backing the work <clears throat> and those feeling empowered to challenge it and consider improving it. Often asking people to criticize uh, tools and techniques or methodologies is a good indication of how empowered that person feels with regards 
to their, their role and their responsibilities. Understanding how people feel and how they respond to change for me is crucial to understanding the potential progress of continuous improvement. It runs deeper than the annual engagement survey or the appraisal process. It's a real measure of people's connections to the organization and its intentions. For me, a positive deviant is the epitome of empowerment. So to bring this back around to the organizational leaders, there must be change. Change in how they motivate, change in how they guide and empower their teams to achieve their goals and objectives. Senj summarizes the focus of this with a quote on the screen. It's not enough to change strategies, structures, and systems unless the thinking that produce those strategies, structures, and systems also changes. So reaffirming the point made at the start of the webinar, processes will inevitably need to change over time. But more fundamentally than that, thoughts and feelings will need to change. If people aren't thinking about things differently and seeing the problems they have through a different frame of reference, that same problem will come back. Any change will be on borrowed time. For Gino, our rebel leaders need not be those with ranks and ranks of subordinates. Our rebel leaders can be anyone preferring to work and operate in a rebel organization that challenges boundaries and for which accomplishment isn't controlled by its own limitations. In the eyes of Gino, the rebel leader has very specific characteristics. Firstly, they seek out the new, keeping a fresh perspective of things, looking for the new, exciting, learning opportunities. Next up, they want challenge. In her book, she writes of Alfred Sloan, who was a chairman of General Motors from 1937 to 56. And when Sloan's board was in full agreement on the issue at the time, it would dismiss them and ask them to come back when they better understood the problem. He clearly wanted them to challenge him, his team and their views. The fear of reprisal is non-existent. Leaders are open to feedback. Leaders are open and vulnerable, openly discussing gaps and clearly acknowledging that others may have the skills that they themselves don't have. Innovation starts by firstly learning everything and then forgetting everything and not allowing oneself to be shackled to tradition. Constraints don't mean limits to creativity. Often in times of despair, the greatest examples of innovation and creativity are found. And lastly, Gino points to the fact that leaders need to understand the issues of the people at the front line face. And leading from the front, getting your hands dirty, is the only way to really do this. And in the process, earn the respect of your followers. So what does the organization look like, this rebel organization? Well, according to Gino, it may be less boardroom and surprisingly more pirate ship. She makes a link to Blackbeard and how he specifically ran a democratic elective and equality led team. Yeah, granted, a team of cutthroats they may have been, but they utilised a tremendously forward thinking structure, which meant that each and every one of the crew knew their role, purpose and expectations. Speaking up was encouraged and equality was a central theme. In my view, a rebel organisation is one where challenge is encouraged, listened to, embraced and acted upon. Expectations are clear and mutually agreed. Fear of speaking up is non-existent. There is a fundamental understanding of goal, purpose and role. We look to unlearn as much as we look to learn. But one thing is for certain. The organisation determines deviance. And from a sociological perspective, this is seemingly the case. So coming back to functionalism, which suggested that deviance is a necessary element and ultimately points to failings. So in an organisational setting, deviant behaviour is pointing to where change is required. It is a system guiding you as a leader to opportunities for growth and development. Structuralism suggests that deviance is a result of conformity, whilst interactualism suggests that deviance is a negotiated perspective. 
Therefore, organizations with core values and belief systems determine behaviors that are acceptable. Labeling from the organization, therefore, creates the impression of good or bad deviance. The challenge is discouraged and adherence to a self-limiting culture is promoted. Even the smallest acts will be considered deviance. Therefore, the organization must allow open speech and allow an open mind with regards to what it considers deviant. Marxism suggests that norms are built to support the rules, which again can be aligned to the organizational setting. The organization must reinforce a coherent message with an underlying reason why challenges and courage and demonstrate action following any feedback. So what does this mean in, in the real world? Well, each listener on this webinar will have different challenges and will be at different stages of their continuous improvement journeys, I'm sure. But I believe that one thing is for sure. When we consider the real world and our challenges as change agents, positive deviance is a vehicle for progressive change and a means of attaining real results. OK, so let's just think about two themes which, in my experience, appear when working with organisations from, from different sectors and different industries. First, introducing and embedding GEMBA to increase awareness and understanding. And secondly, learning organisations to select projects that are achievable and suitable and then training people up and equipping them with the tools to, to do the task. Let's just take a moment to consider these two examples. Firstly, GEMBA. I'm sure that listeners have been on great GEMBA walks where ideas flow and people leave with a real sense of progress, teamwork and support. And unfortunately, I'm sure that many of you have been on disappointing GEMBA walks where people feel undermined, underappreciated and not listened to. By leading with open questions, encouraging constructive criticism, and challenge, we develop a greater opportunity to begin challenging the status quo. However, although being uncomfortable is a good thing, a fine line exists between productive and counterproductive. Leaders must realize that through a poorly delivered comment, accusation or bad tempered reaction, literally months of hard work can unravel and go down the toilet. Remember the words of Francesco Gino, her thoughts of rebel leaders were that they looked for the new exciting learning opportunities. They encouraged people to challenge not only the leader, but the systems. They didn't reprimand people for speaking up. They were open and vulnerable to acknowledging that others may know more than themselves. They don't allow themselves, themselves to be shackled to tradition and processes that have been in place for many years. But they have the ability to use those constraints to drive creativity. They get on the front line, they go to GEMBA, they ask questions, they listen, and they support. When considering training and project selection, uh, if we consider an organization which wants to invest in training and then release these guys onto the business's problems, in my experience, projects selected by the teams doing the work will return better results. Projects cherry-picked by executives from a boardroom and forced onto the teams often stall and result in a significant amount of misguided efforts and energy. The key is to use the data and feedback to highlight areas for improvement, allow the teams to develop their own objectives based on what they feel is achievable, allow people to opt out. It's much better to have a team of volunteers than a crowd of victims. Remember the work of Pascal and Stern in Positive Deviance, look for the invisible innovators. They seek the outliers and exceptions. They learn through doing, they make mistakes. They allow people to opt out and they allow people to discover their own solutions. And then they let them own it. So hopefully over the course of this, this webinar, you can see that by empowering yourself and your team to challenge the status quo, there's a tremendous opportunity to identify an action change. Deviance, when positive, is something to be embraced and encouraged.
keep an openness to ideas, feedback and criticism. Listen to become more self-aware and reflective. Lead with positive energy, fueling the change. Give people the option. Don't railroad them. Allow people to own their own problems, develop their own solutions and own the implementation. Learn to unlearn. Give people a reason to care. Make it theirs. Give them room to be accountable. And whether at the Gemba or at the board meeting, always remember to be a pirate. Thank you uh, for listening today. I really do hope that this introduction to positive deviance was interesting and, and maybe helps to empower you and embrace your inner pirate. Um, my details are on the screen. Please feel free to contact me if you'd like to uh, pick up this discussion. It will be great to hear from, from you and, and your experiences. Thank you uh, very much. Paul, well, thank you for the presentation. And before we open up things for question and answer period, I we'll want to make a few announcements about some other webinars and other resources that you can get uh, for free from the team at Kinexus. So first off, I want to tell you about upcoming webinars. If you could advance that, please. So Greg Jacobson and I, um, Dr. Greg Jacobson, our CEO and one of our co-founders, Greg and I are going to be doing episode 25 of our Ask Us Anything series. That's going to be held on October 28th. These are 30 minute video um, webinar broadcasts where we answer questions from our Kinexus community. So when you register for that, you will be given an opportunity to submit a question. You can do that at kinexus.com slash webinars. And then our next presentation style webinar is going to be presented by Ritu Ward. She is a vice president of regional laboratory services at Mercy Health. And her presentation is going to be titled Leadership Behaviors to Guide Effective Change. That's going to be November 19th. And again, you can register for these um, right after the webinar today, if you like, by going to kinexus.com slash webinars. If you also want to explore within our website, we have other resources, including our on-demand library. So this webinar and um, all of our past webinars from I don't know, the last four or five years, uh, are all there in that library. It's all free. You can also find those on our Kinexus YouTube channel, if you like. And then we have a blog. Uh, you can go to blog.kinexus.com. There's actually two blogs. One that's a general blog about improvement methodologies and one that is more specifically um, targeted for our customers. It talks about new features in Kinexus and other things that are of interest um, to customers. So we also have... Uh, we have the podcast series. So the audio from today's webinar will be available there. You can find out, you can find more at kinexus.com slash podcast. You can subscribe uh, through all of the usual podcast sources. And finally, we have our Q&A. So uh, again, you've got Paul's email address, the website for uh, his firm, and then we've got all of the, uh, the Kinexus contact info. So um, let's see, here's, here's a question. Paul, um, how would you suggest pursuing positive deviance in an organization where the transactional management philosophy is strong and extremely entrenched, efforts to pursue a new direction is punished, and the personnel involved are punished, but there's there's a tough scenario. What are your thoughts? Um, maybe uh, maybe look for a different job. Um, yeah. No, it's uh, I think a lot of organisations do uh, traditionally have um, a very transactional uh, method for trying to engage people with change uh, or, or just changing their behavioural style. Um, I think the old uh, carrot and stick. Uh, methodology is, is quite common unfortunately um, and I think it's 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 a long road but it, it takes time it takes leadership development it takes um, trust for those leaders to understand that things can be done differently um, and it's it's not it's certainly not easy um, I've, I've worked with organizations some of them 
you see people super keen, super driven, lots of fantastic ideas. They put them forward to their line manager and it just falls flat. And the response of that person really speaks volumes. I've seen those guys shrink into themselves and never put forward a great idea again. Uh, but on the flip side, I've seen guys think, you know what, I'm not going to take that as, no as an answer. I'm going to continue. I'm going to find a way to make this work. And for me, that's the positive deviant element. That guy hasn't accepted no. That guy's thinking, right, well, this route, this journey, this this path is blocked. But I'm going to find an alternative route. Um, so he's almost not waiting for the leadership team to catch up. He's going to do it. He's going to find a way of making it work. Um, if that's not possible in the organisation, if, if the punishments are that severe, if if people aren't genuinely willing to listen, um, then it's it's a challenge that needs to be taken at the top of the organisation, absolutely. Yeah, because it's um, just to follow up on that, it's probably fair to say, uh, we, we, we can, we're not going to get very far if we just um, you know, lecture people that they need to be brave and um, you know, that, that they, they, they should be brave and be positive deviants, but that kicks in that survival anxiety among other things, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, um, leaders will traditionally use transactional methods. We, we, we know this. We see this in organizations. Um, the transformation element is, is as much you as an employee as it is the leaders you need to find that motivation in, in yourself really um and don't rely on others to to give you that motivation um and yeah this survival anxiety change triggers this survival anxiety or disruption triggers this survival anxiety and people automatically think right it's, it's the employees who are experiencing this uh, and they forget that the managers are too to forget that the guys who are having to execute this change are feeling the same levels and types of anxiety. And they go with what they know. They go with what they believe works. Um, and it is commonplace for them to amplify this level of anxiety, to try and force the change, to try and force things to happen. Um, but Edgar Schein puts all these cases, says, you know what? Forget that. Forget about doing that. Try and make people more comfortable. Try and ease people's anxiety levels. Try and work with them, engage with them. Um, if they feel so they can do something, they'll they'll give it the best shot. Um, and if you think about joining a gym, let's say you want to start eating more healthy, you want to start exercising more, you go to a, a gym, the task is is maybe quite a, quite a challenge. Uh, but if you're with a group of people, you're with a team, you're with a personal trainer, these guys make it feel fun, make it feel as though it's not such an arduous task. It's, it's, it's within grasp. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's within sight, but it's slightly out of reach. Um, then suddenly that, that goal, that task of having to do these things becomes, becomes achievable, becomes realistic. Um, but, yeah, it's unfortunate that, uh, that many, many managers will, will rely on this amplification of, of survival anxiety. And, um, yeah, I mean, we talk about the survival anxiety. That also makes me think of, like, the fight or flight reaction, as, as it's called. And, um, you know, I think one of the things we know about the fight or flight response, it, it, it shuts down our ability um, for for thinking and creativity, which which is not good for an organization, right? Yeah, yeah. If you think about organizations that might be going through a, a difficult financial spell, or they might be um, be under a little bit of pressure to deliver certain results, um, and then throw into the mix people uh, are fearful of their positions, are fearful of job security, and suddenly all that creativity, all that that thought process, all that, that good stuff that the organization needs suddenly grinds to a halt. So by, by doing this, it's almost self-destructive. Um, by putting them in a position where they're, that they're afraid, then these, these ideas stop flowing. Um, and the stuff that the leaders need to help the organization progress and become better at what it does, these things stop surfacing. Um, so then you enter this vicious cycle. Um, where things, unfortunately, may get worse before they get any better. 
So there's a follow-up here um, about carrot and stick. It says carrot and stick seems appropriate in sales when focused on results or outcomes, right? As long as the approach is allowed to be in a positive deviant, I'm not quite sure what this says, manner. Is it an approach? Uh, I don't, I'm not, Rick, I might need you to clarify. I'm not sure what it says. Allowed to be, as long as the approach is allowed to be in the positive deviant manner outcomes. Um, I, is carrot and stick ever appropriate? Uh, I would argue no, because the carrot <laughs> and the carrot and the stick analogy, the carrot is used to, or um, the stick is used to dangle the carrot in front of the donkey. The, the stick was never intended for hitting the donkey, which is what most people mean when they talk about the carrot or the stick, because hitting a donkey will give it survival anxiety. It won't move. And I, I, I think the same is same is true for workers, so I don't know. Sorry to answer the question. I don't think that analogy is at all appropriate for humans. What would you think, Paul? <laughs> yeah, I agree. It's um, the, the carrot and the stick. It's um, I think if you, if you went to this this arena of saying, well, we'll we'll offer you as a sales guy more reward. We'll offer you more uh, more compensation for doing a good job. That's fantastic until the next business comes along and offers a bigger carrot. Um, so if you want to retain employees, if you want to keep a sustainable culture, if you want to try and drive change and make people feel empowered, I'd argue that um, just just offering rewards, financial or otherwise, isn't sustainable. Yeah. So another follow up comment here. Um, it's carrot and stick in its truest sense is a promised reward that never happens because, yeah, that that carrot is dangled out in front of. Uh, that, that was good. I like that one. That's, uh, that one's a good one. Very funny. Yeah. Um, so let's see. Another question here. Can you share a time in a workplace where you've been a positive deviant? Can you share a specific example and how was that was received? Yeah, absolutely. So um, let's think of a, a good example. Um, I'll um, I'll use quite a light-hearted example. I think um, I I was with an organisation and a few years ago, um, and this organisation was very traditional, um, and everybody would come to work in uh, trousers, uh, shirts, ties, all very smart. And my role at the time was in customer facing, and I thought, well, why do I have to wear a, a, such these these clothes? Why do I have to dress to dress like this? It was like a, a turkey trussed up for Christmas. I just thought, you know what, this this isn't me. So I thought I'd do a little social experiment. And over the course of about three weeks, I went from wearing <clears throat> shirt and tie and trousers to wearing uh, like chinos and short sleeve mm. shirt, no tie. And I thought, let's just see what happens. And nobody followed. Nobody did this. Mm. Um, but I thought, I'll keep going and see, see what happens. Um, and then about a week after, an email went around the entire organization uh, from the HR department saying, we have a dress code. Please ensure you adhere to this dress code. So even my manager would see me walking every day, sit down next to him and see me dressed like this. My, my colleagues would all see me dressed exactly the same, like this, but nobody said a word. Um, so it's a bit of a light-hearted example. Uh, so I don't really go into any specifics with others where we've done specific projects, but that's an example where I was, was trying to gauge how that organization was going to respond to something. And its response wasn't very personal. Its response was very formal, much like the dress sense, I suppose, of the organization. Yeah. Um, and there was... Uh, an unwillingness to to challenge that it was just the the norms of how things are done um yeah. so even the little things like that are indicative of a, a culture within an organization yeah and i uh, just a quick story uh, for those of you who've seen me present about control charts or process behavior charts applied to metrics i feel like i'm being a positive deviant um, every time I sort of push that approach instead of just, you know, going with the flow and saying, yeah, let's do red, green color coding on our metrics and let's try to explain a root cause for every small up and down. Um, you know, I, that's my attempt at um, being a positive deviant. But like you said, it's not always sometimes people follow, sometimes they don't. Right. Mm, absolutely. Another good example was um, 
working with an organization, we were implementing uh, near misses. We were implementing uh, an improved health and safety culture and trying to drive people to be more aware, to try and drive down accidents. And the stance we took was was very much like what you see in other manufacturing organizations. It was um, very directive. If, if a hazard or a, a risk was seen, we'd capture it. Um, but this, this organization was position itself in, in a different place. They wouldn't see these, the, the same risks. They wouldn't see the same hazards because they were almost blinded by the fact that they'd see these things every day. So to be a positive deviant meant walking around, recording these uh, these hazards, these near misses, speaking to people, asking people, well, how could you do that differently? Do you think this is a hazard as well as I do? And none of that had ever been done. There, there was almost a trust that these guys would just look after themselves sometimes. Um, so the positive deviance thing isn't necessarily just looking at dress sense. It's not looking at uh, implementing lean. It's not looking at uh, process improvements. It can be literally any element of organization. It, it's steps to try and improve it, thinking outside the box, challenging the way things are done, challenging that culture. So we've got uh, three more questions I think we might be able to get to. The first one I think is, is fairly quick. Um, would you mind clarifying the two types of anxiety again, please? Yeah, so this is Edgar Schein, um, real big fan of his work. Um, he speaks of two types of anxiety that get released when, when people are destabilized. First, it's the survival anxiety. Uh, this is an anxiety around um, the fear that, the business, for example, the business may not survive. Your role may no longer be needed. Um, you may be unemployed. You may get fired. Um, the next is learning anxiety. So this is the fear that you're not capable or the fear that you're going to lose uh, possession or, or, or power or authority status. It's a, very much a, a personal personal fear is a learning anxiety. Um, and those are, are two very distinct anxieties that, that Edgar Schein uh, comments are released during this change process. Okay, one other question. Uh, many philosophies focus on transformational, th there are many philosophies focused on transformational thinking. What trends are you seeing in industry in general? And do you think, are there differences across different countries? Um, it's a good question. Um, I think across international boundaries, you do see differences in how people um, respond to problems sometimes. Um, I've had the opportunity to work over over in, in the States. Uh, and while I was over there, uh, the guys were, were full of energy, full of enthusiasm. Uh, I've worked in other countries where you see a, a different take and the more uh, reliant on import, more reliant on instruction. Um, in the UK, um, I think there's a growing, uh, a growing trend, should we say, for organisations to try and improve and move forward. Generally, this is done through the announcement. Unfortunately, it's done through an announcement of a lean transformation, um, whatever that means. Uh, but it's the, the, there is increasingly this focus on organisations attempt to become lean, attempt to become more efficient. Um, and it's, it's interesting to see how the small to medium-sized companies deal with this. The companies that don't have the big budgets, the companies that don't have uh, the expertise on tap that they can bring in at uh, will, um, and how they tackle this at a, at a ground level with, with lesser resources. Uh, and for me, that, that's, that's a really interesting dynamic at the moment uh, because it's something they can't simply throw money at. It's something they've really got to think about, and, and the challenge is very real. But the benefits are huge for these these SMEs, for these these organisations. They can really change how they operate. But they've got to be very clever how they do it because they can't just throw money at a brand new computer system. They can't throw money at some consultants uh, who are going to descend on the organisation for eighteen months. They've got to try and be smart and move the organisation forward um, in, in such a way that it returns the investment, it gets the buy-in from the staff, um, and the organization is visibly progressing. 
All right, and a final question, and, and this is kind of unfair to throw at you, but we, uh, with time <laughs> being short, but we can run over a minute, I think, or a little bit, because um, it's a good question. Trust remains a major challenge that, quote unquote, pirates. So, um, so the need to, uh, I think it says, um, so trust remains a challenge if people need to creatively foster um, I'm still trying to reread that. Are there any, let me try to state it this way. Are there any concrete recommendations about how to try to build trust in an organization? Um, I think trust is, is something that can be easily eroded and difficult to build. Um, in, in my experience, it's, it's, it's gained through evidence. I think the guys who are doing the job need to see uh, their managers, their leaders, um, walk the walk and talk the talk, return on the things that they promise, um, which sounds easy. Um, but in reality, when an organization is undergoing change, when there's a new leadership team, when something changes, um, often big promises are made. Uh, they almost over-promise and under-deliver in some instances. And for me, that's reaffirming this, uh, this skepticism. For me, trust is built on, on delivery. Um, and it's, it's that simple. Um, I think if guys can see that their leaders and their managers are, are doing their utmost in the interest of the organization, uh, as well as the employees, then they will they'll, they'll foster trust. They, they will they'll, they'll see that surface. OK, well, I think we'll, we'll go ahead and wrap up here. Paul, thank you for sharing your thoughts here during the Q&A. Thanks, people, for the questions. And um, more importantly, Paul, thank you today for your presentation. We really appreciate yeah, no you problem, joining us and sharing, yeah, sharing these different frameworks uh, for people. Um, again, remind people, if you want to sign up for uh, upcoming webinars or to view the on-demand library, you can go to kinexus.com slash webinars. So on behalf of the team at Kinexus, uh, we want to say thank you. and uh, boy, eh, is, is this a catchphrase? Well, some people say this. I'm gonna. I should just embrace it. We'll. See, it's silly. We'll see. You, we'll see you kind next time. And I'm gonna work on my delivery of that kind next time. Thank you, everyone, for being here today.